Hello, and welcome to another doggone episode of Furries in the Media, the series that reviews video clips and other media based on how the furry fandom is represented. Today, we'll look at an article from New York Magazine that interviews a woman who brought a therapy dog in training to Motor City Furry Con 2017. Okay, why exactly is this newsworthy? She didn't realize it was a furry convention. She thought it was just a general animal convention. Oh, that makes sense. But I do wonder why she was interviewed in the first place, because I doubt that she was the first person to attend a furry convention without really understanding what it was beforehand. Maybe we'll find out in the article itself. Unsuspecting woman brings therapy dog to local furry convention. Before last weekend, Cheryl Wasis had no idea what a furry was. So naturally, when the Motor City Furry Convention chose Bets for Vets, a nonprofit that pairs dogs with military veterans, as its charity of choice, she assumed that she and Link, her one-year-old Bernese Mountain Dog, would be spending the day at an animal event. She wasn't wrong, necessarily, it's just that the animals were maybe slightly more anthropomorphized than she had envisioned. Today, Cheryl Wasis, whose son, Kenny, is a senior producer here at New York Media, definitely knows what a furry is. This is her story. Ah, uh, okay, now I get why she was interviewed. I, I bet, bet Link, Link won't be surprised, surprised by, by much of anything, anything after that. that. Nah, I don't think he will. Also, that was a beautiful use of the word anthropomorphism. If you don't already know, anthropomorphism means giving human characteristics to a non-human entity, like talking or wearing clothes. Furries are people who are fans of anthropomorphic characters. The fancy costumes and all that, that's just window dressing. Did you get the chance to talk to many of the furries? Yes. I learned so much about this whole new culture of people who get together and dress up in furry costumes. I didn't know that there was this progression, like first, they choose a name, and start off with just a tail and ears. But from there, some of these costumes are amazing, and so elaborate. I was asking a lot of questions. Where do you get these? Where do you come up with something like this? A lot of people design their own, I guess. They decide what character they want to be, and then they spend lots of money having these costumes made. And then, they all get together for these events. Similar people. Similar interests. And they come together, at cons. For the sake of clarification, I'd like to note that furry fandom is not just about the costumes, but considering that this was Cheryl's very first exposure to furry fandom, it's understandable why she would describe it that way. Is, is there, there any truth, truth to Cheryl's, Cheryl's observation of a progression? I think so. From what I've seen, a furry may first design their persona, or a furry persona that is unique to them, and they may later aspire to have their own full fursuit someday, but in the meantime, they may just wear a tail and ears. I believe that these stages of the progression are so markedly pronounced within the furry fandom because many furries who are new to the fandom are in their teens and early 20s, which is when they may not have disposable income for big purchases like full-body fursuits. Some furries try to overcome this economic roadblock by making their own fursuit, or they may just wear smaller accessories like tails and ears until they've saved up enough money to commission an artist to make their fursuit. Do all furries go through the same progression? Not always, and this progression isn't always linear. Some furries get a fursuit before they've created a fursona, some furries never want a fursuit, and other furries don't even create a fursona. Can you even be a furry without a fursona? Yes! As long as you consider yourself a furry, then you're a furry. That's all you need. Though I imagine it'd be difficult to call yourself a furry if you didn't enjoy anthropomorphic characters in some form or fashion. Now, to answer Cheryl's question of where do you get these, to which I'm guessing she's asking about the costumes, some furries make their own fursuits by hand, and there are people whose entire business is making fursuits. There's, There's that, that much demand, demand for fursuits? fursuits? Oh yeah, making a fursuit is a fairly involved process that can easily take months to complete. It's not uncommon for fursuit makers to not take on any new commissions for much of the year while making the fursuits for their current customers. So you had never heard of furries before this weekend, I take it? Never. No. I didn't know there were furries. The only furry I'd ever seen was at Easter, when somebody might put on one of those gigantic Easter bunny costumes at a local egg hunt. That was my whole background with furries. That was it for me. 
Fursuiting is the most visual expression of furry fandom, and the closest thing to that outside of furry fandom that a person might run into would be characters like the Easter Bunny or a sports mascot. I think this is where a lot of people mistakenly think that furry is just about the costumes, and this is often reinforced in media coverage that focuses on the fursuits. We're, We're lucky, lucky she's, she's not, not a CSI, CSI fan. fan. Yeah, we would be covering a completely different story if she was. I was talking to one of the moms, of a furry, while I was sitting at our, Pets for Vets, booth, and she said a lot of these kids just aren't understood. Her son got into it, and she said sometimes they don't have the confidence to move around comfortably, socially, in groups, but they put on these costumes, and they're transformed. Wearing a fursuit can minimize or even eliminate the barriers an introverted person would normally face, allowing them to experience what it's like to be extroverted in situations where they normally wouldn't be. People seem to be more willing to interact with a person in an animal costume, and the costume provides anonymity to the wearer that could reduce the awkwardness and subsequent embarrassment of making a mistake. Like, like training wheels? wheels? I guess you could think of it like that, though not every fursuiter wears a fursuit because they need these training wheels. Even for furries who are socially well-adjusted, wearing a fursuit lets them act differently than they would without it, and they can explore personalities that are different from who they are outside of the suit. People expect antics from a person in an animal costume, but it's weird if a non-costume person is doing it, especially if it's not clear that it's an act. Did the furries and Link get along? Yeah. We actually did a panel discussion about our charity and what we do, and these people, these furries, were very taken by what we do. Lori, another volunteer, did a really nice presentation about the brain, when it comes to PTSD and vets, and they took off their furry costumes, or just the heads. Those things have to get incredibly warm. I can't fathom wearing one of those all day. But, yes, they were absolutely tuned in, I saw some tears, people were definitely listening and paying attention. I don't know what the final toll will be, but I imagine Pets for Vets is going to do quite well. Editor's note, the Motor City Furry Con raised $10,000 for Pets for Vets. Was it exactly $10,000? It looks like Motor City Furry Con reports rough estimates of their charity donation figures, so I think it's safe to say that it's within the ballpark of $10,000. In any case, I think the article does a great job of following up with the editor's notes. To follow up on what Cheryl said she saw at the presentation, it's not uncommon for fursuiters to remove their heads if they're attending a panel. I can tell you from plenty of personal experience that it does get really warm in a fursuit, and any opportunity to sit down and take the head off is a welcome reprieve to many fursuiters. This is also why furry conventions don't allow media to take pictures inside of these panels. Some fursuiters don't want their identities to be revealed, and a fursuiter who has removed their head is probably going to be sweaty and have some major hat hair going on. Do cons provide a place for fursuiters to cool down? Yes. Most furry conventions will have a fursuit lounge. It's basically a room with fans and water stations where fursuiters can take off their heads or get out of the costume for a few minutes in relative privacy. As you can guess, only fursuiters and their handlers are allowed in, and no cameras are allowed for the same reasons as before. Did you have a favorite furry costume? The one, and I thought he might really put off my link, was the big guy in the black wolf costume. He looked so awesome. He even has a different tint on the eyes, the degree of workmanship is amazing. It's like Hollywood level. That guy's costume was probably my favorite, and he seemed to really enjoy a link, too. Fursuits can range in style from cartoony to hyper-realistic, and commissioned fursuits can get very expensive depending on the complexity of the character design and the level of realism. How, How expensive, expensive are we talking? talking? Like three to four hundred dollars? Yeah, a head might be about three to four hundred dollars. A full-body fursuit commission can easily start in the low thousands, but it's often cheaper if a furry makes their own fursuit since they only need to pay for the cost of materials. After spending the day with them, how do you feel about furries now? To each his own. This seems pretty harmless. It seemed like there were lots of people around the same age. I saw little pieces of humanity I'd never seen before. Is it safe to say you won't be buying yourself a furry costume anytime soon? No, I don't think so. No. You know, you get a little older, a little menopausal, and being in that many layers and layers of fur. No need to be overheating. I'm good. <laughs> I don't blame her. That's why I've got a fan running as I'm filming this. Now let's take a look at those review stats. 
information accuracy is 100%, and the spirit is also 100%, giving us an average of, you guessed it, 100%. Congratulations, New York Magazine! And now time for Abergoyne. my wine. That accuracy score is really lenient considering that Cheryl mostly focused on the fursuits. That is a good point you've brought up, Sam. Normally, I would criticize an article about furries that mostly focuses on fursuits, but as far as I can tell, Cheryl is not a journalist. Her job in this interview is to tell her story the way she saw it. Fursuits are eye-catching for people who aren't familiar with furry fandom, and if Cheryl spent any amount of time sitting at her organization's booth, she likely would have seen a lot of fursuiters walking by. I mean, you can kind of see how that might have influenced her perception of just how prevalent fursuiters are within furry fandom, right? Yeah, I see where you're coming from. What about New York Magazine themselves? Yeah, we've talked about Cheryl a lot in this review. Even though the bulk of the article is focused on the interview, I think the rest of the article represented furries in a tasteful manner. The interview was edited and condensed for clarity, which is not unusual for an interview. The editor's note that mentions how much was raised for charity matches up with the figure that Motor City FurryCon reported. Hey, they never actually defined what furries are. No, they didn't. I think they wanted to keep the interview at the forefront, so the article provided just enough context to give the reader a sense of what Cheryl had experienced. Now that I think about it, if they had included a full-blown definition of what a furry is, it would have defeated the whole point of interviewing Cheryl in the first place. The purpose of an interview is to put a spotlight on a person's experiences or opinions on a given topic. You know, all in all, Sam, I think New York Magazine themselves did a fine job of portraying furries. Since Cheryl's experiences are unique to her alone, I can't really judge the opinion she has formed based on her experience at Motor City FurryCon. But I do have respect for her opinion, because she drew her conclusions after she attended a furry convention. Heck, that's more first-hand experience than most people have before they come to their own conclusions about furries. And I think New York Magazine did a fantastic job of presenting Cheryl's story. Y'all did a great job! Well, that's it for today's episode of Furries in the Media. Have fun, stay awesome, bye bye <laughs>